Good morning, good morning. I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, I'm not sure that we are. Is, is there anybody there? <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. All right. So good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Today is Saturday, the 4th of December. How could it possibly be the 4th of December? I don't get this. I don't get this at all. I mean, you know, the time just keeps whizzing by. Is it because I'm getting older that time is go so fast. I thought that as you got older, time slowed, but it doesn't seem to have slowed for me at all. All right, so so it's the 4th of December, it's Saturday morning, and it is story time. And I do have a quite a neat little story for you, uh, actually. Um, but um, I might tell two stories, or maybe I'll just save one, one of them for another time. We'll see how much time we've got as we go along today because i know that you all like time for questions and i know we love to hear your comments so before we begin first of all i'd like to say good morning to my spirit guide gregor who is to my right side as always standing by my right side and i'd like to say good morning to chris who is in vermont right chris yes i am good morning rosemary good morning everyone is it cold and snowy and windy and chilly and are you wearing a thick sweater and wrapped in a scarf and a hat? <laughs> That's funny, Rosemary. It's 27 degrees, no snow today because we had it yesterday. I, I do have a blanket wrapped around my lap, yes. <laughs> oh, I remember those days. I do remember those days. But, you know, I had in Vermont, I had a beautiful house in Vermont, which had enormous high, high windows, big vaulted ceilings and high windows. I don't know if you remember, Chris. It was and, gorgeous. Um, I would in the, I would always have a chair which sat sort of in the, in the window there because you could actually walk into it. It's a huge, big window. It's very wide and very high. Um, and um, the entire place looked out on you know the 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 lakes the 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 mount the woods the mountains the you know the forests out there it was a phenomenal view we had sort of like two ranges of mountains that we could look out at, at as well but in the winter time it was the place to sit because believe it or not with the windows every day that it was sunny and we did we do get a lot of sun in the winter time it's freezing cold but we do get a lot of sun but the sun would come into the windows and you'd sit there. It would almost be like sitting in a greenhouse with phenomenal views and the dogs would come. That, they, it was, that was their favorite place in my lap in that chair as well because it was the warmest place in the house. And, uh, you know, just thinking about that and thinking with you sitting with a blanket on your lap, sometimes in that window you get so steaming hot, even though it was freezing cold, you get so steaming hot and the sun would just warm the entire room. It was it was, it was was fabulous. You probably remember all of that, Chris. Not uh, only that, your cr Christmas cactuses bloomed like crazy. Oh, didn't they though? I know, I know I had, you know, on we had a huge big deck that we walked out on and, you know, those Christmas cactuses, they would flower all year long and I would have, they would hang down you know several feet yeah gosh i should do more of that stuff uh yeah those cactus i mean the the flowers on those cactuses were as big as your hand as well if you remember those yeah it was beautiful beautiful place beautiful beautiful place to live now you've got me on a mission chris because now i have to find those cactuses once again and um uh see if i can find them because they were just these gorgeous big hanging cactus and uh, not the prickly kind don't misunderstand me not the, the nice soft leafed ones but the flowers on them were huge now enough of this you know talking of gardening and all the rest of it are you cold there chris is it cold <laughs> no it's warming up <laughs> 27 degrees now i've got my friend mary lou here with me and she is definitely a Florida girl, born in Chicago, I think, right, Mary Lou? Born yep, in so. Chicago, but when she was four years old, her parents moved to Florida and she's been here ever since. So, and uh, that's a long time. We're not going to say how long, but it's uh, she's been here for a long time, for a lifetime, let's say that. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea of her, you know, being in a 27 degree <laughs> atmosphere, what do you think of that idea, um, Mary Lou? Would you like to? Would, would you like to be where Chris is? I'm sorry, not at all. 
<laughs> See? You have no idea what you're missing. Oh, oh yes, we do. I oh, do. Yeah. I do. Anyway, all right. So, um, Chris, do we, is there anybody there? Oh, yes. And we still have people logging on. We have a bunch of people in the chat room right now. So they're all oh. getting ready and posed, uh, not posed, but ready for your story time. Okay. Well, are there any comments yet? While we're waiting for the people to get on before I sort of give it a few minutes to just to, to be to begin the story. Yes, Maria is saying she admires you so much. Mark is saying a merry morning to all from Tulsa. Oh, oh a merry morning. I like that. I like that, Mark. <laughs> Carolyn saying Vermont sounds magical. No, no. Everybody yes, says yes. Every everybody says it's magical and it is if you're inside looking outside it truly is a winter wonderland it really is uh, phenomenal and um you know in fact at all times of the year um i mean it is a magical place um until you go outside you think springs come right and you go outside and it's sort of may june time and then you don't feel anything going on around you, but you might just put your hand in your hairline and it comes out bloody, thick, bloody. And then you put your hand here and it comes out bloody. And you realize that they have these wonderful little black June bugs that you can't feel that them bite you, but everybody walks around sort of uh, end of May, June time, everybody walks around and you can see they've got streaks of red bloody stuff here and here and here. And so, so, and then of course, in the summertime, you've got those big giant horse flies. Am I making Vermont sound fabulous to you? But they have these huge giant horse flies and boy, do they bite. I mean, you know, they really, and of course, the, the worst thing of all are the ticks. So it is a fantastic, it's a beautiful place. And if you're immune to all of those other things that go on, uh, you'd have a wonderful time. And I know, I'm, I don't want to disparage Vermont because it is an incredibly beautiful state. It, it really is a beautiful state. I just can't personally deal with the seven months of winter and the five months of something else, not really summer, and all the bugs and the stuff like that. I, that's not for me. But then you see, I am a princess. <laughs> Mary Lou came today. I'm going to tell you this because it's funny, right? She's actually really funny. Oh, well, I think it is anyway. But she came She came today. And um, okay, so it, I'm going to show you this glass. This is a, this is, I don't know if you can see it. It's a, it's a Waterford crystal glass. And it, they're one, it's one of my favorites when I use them every single day, right? So... <laughs> So, so I say, getting myself a drink, I say to Mary Lou, would you, would you, would you like a drink? And she, and she said, oh yes, I'd love one. I said, plastic or crystal? Because <laughs> she usually goes for plastic and I don't like plastic. So I say, plastic or crystal? She says, surprisingly, she says crystal. Large crystal or small crystal? <laughs> So, so I've got my toffee nose on, you know. So, 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 so shall I get you the small crystal, my dear? And then, and then on my sofa, I've got this enormous, huge uh, blanket, which was a, a gift to me from a very, very dear friend of mine several years ago. And it's sort of draped over the cushions. And as Mary Lou's coming in, she's got stuff all over the sofa. So she's sorting stuff out, uh, you know, that to, she's, she brought stuff for me and now we're sorting it all out. And I noticed that one of her bags is on my beautiful blanket. Uh -oh. So I just very, I think I'm doing it quite surreptitiously, but I just moved the blanket aside. And she says, oh, I'm sorry. And I said, well, it's just that it's cashmere. <laughs> wow. It's just that it's cashmere. And so it's hard to get any, I don't want to get any marks on it. So <laughs> I start laughing. Because here I am talking about, would you like the large crystal or the small crystal? You really don't want plastic, do you? No, 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 no. And then please be careful with my cashmere blanket. Talk about snooty, wow. stuck up. 
<laughs> Are you ever going to come back to my house? <laughs> Very I, won't, low. I won't sit near that. <laughs> anyway, so here we are. Sorry, everybody. I'm just laughing at something. You know, you've got to be here and then, then you're not. So, any other comments, Chris, before I start? Well, now that you've terrorized half the world on the uh, downside of Vermont, you neglected to mention that you lived up in the middle of the mountains. I did. Deep in the woods. I did. And that many of the people in Vermont do not do that. So... <laughs> So I am true. not getting bitten by ticks or flies or fleas <laughs> or snakes or any of that stuff that you have thus described. Look, I didn't mention the caterpillar infestation, <laughs> did I, that we had one year. You walk out in the driveway and you couldn't help but crunch, crunch, crunch because there were billions of caterpillars everywhere. Anyway, no, Vermont is a beautiful place and some of the towns are so wonderful and so quaint. Yes. I did live, <laughs> I did live halfway up a mountain. It's so true. I did neglect to tell you all of that. Just, you know, just, uh, so, sorry. I'm not, I'm trying not to disparage Vermont because it's beautiful, but I think I just did it anyway. I think you did. <laughs> I think all those, let, let's call them the seven plagues, probably are the things that pushed you towards your new home in Florida, right? Yes. <laughs> Oh, definitely. I absolutely had to uh, uh, get out. I couldn't stand the cold any longer because it went on for too long. You know, they have, uh, you know, they have six seasons in Vermont. They have, uh, you know, the four that we always have, you know, summer, winter, spring, fall, that sort of thing. And, and then they have stick season and then they have mud season so and mud you season forgot is... construction season oh oh that's the what well, isn't doesn't that go on all the time it, it can't no it gets too cold anyway, to lay the tar yeah, down well, yeah so in the summertime it's construction season so there we are i am painting a very bad picture of vermont and it's beautiful and i have beautiful photos i have a beautiful calendar that my daughter made me of, of my home in Vermont, which was stunningly, stunningly beautiful. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving on, Chris. <laughs> are there any? What What are we doing this morning? Uh, I'm just story enjoying time. That. Yeah. Oh, yes, that. So, do we have any comments? Anything going on before I begin my once upon a time? Well, you always have comments and questions before you start, so it's really the order in which you want to take them. We'll have a two or three comments while I get myself together. All right. I am says, thanks for talking about Vermont. I was looking at cheap houses there. I'll stay in Santa Barbara. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. You see, Chris. Actually, Santa Barbara's beautiful. You should stay there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Sharon saying, I just want to thank you for an amazing consultation. Thanks for your effort and time. Oh, darling, that you're so nice. That's so nice of you. And of course, you know, you are very, very welcome. And I need a report from you. Just, just, looking, just thinking about that. Yes, I need a report. Chris. Mark saying he's laughing at being snooty and stuck up. <laughs> and he agrees Vermont is absolutely beautiful and those who live there love it. Well, I lived there and I didn't love it. <laughs> so we did like, for a time. You I did, actually. Did. I did for, yeah, I did for, look, you know, wherever you go in the world, you, you never find a perfect place. There are always things to, you know, to, to question, there are always things to wonder about, ponder about, you know, there's always, there's always something we can find that isn't quite right about any place that we're looking for. So if you're moving to a place and you think it's going to be perfect or more perfect than the place that you're living in, you know, be careful because, you know, um, no, nowhere's, nowhere's perfect, nowhere. Vicky says, it's not very magical here in the UK. It's five degrees and heavy rain. Yes, but here's the thing about the UK. And now, you see, I am now going to devastate 
any American, well, anybody other than the British, on, who is listening to this show. Because what the Brits have that no one in the rest of the world have. <laughs> Am I really going to say this? Of course I'm going to say this. We have each other. And we are a lovely bunch of people. We neighbour. We take care of each other. We do all that fun stuff. You don't look at me. Mary Lou is looking at me. Is this is where I go, <laughs> you're breaking up. You're breaking up. <laughs> so even though, my darling, it's five degrees and cold and wet, you know, we we are a lovely bunch of people. I'm your neighbour. <laughs> Mary Lou <Lewis. laughs> Anyway, all right, uh, you know, I'm going to get myself into some serious hot water if I'm not careful now. So, are we ready, Chris? We're ready. Here we go, once upon a time. Once upon a time, many years ago, <laughs> in England, I might say, I used to have classes and I took students and that's how we began with our um, healing uh, organisation. We started off with uh, one healing centre which went into two healing centers and then three and four and so on. And, and um, uh, I would train uh, people my, myself. And anyway, so, uh, so here we are one, on one of these nights where my students had come to my home and we were, you know, we were uh, talking about uh, healing and uh, I was teaching them about the different exercises, so on and so forth. And, in amongst this particular group of people was a, a, a lovely, lovely lady. She was a nurse. She worked at the Doncaster Royal Hospital. Any of you from England will, uh, you know, live in the north will know where that is. But anyway, that's where she worked. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and she, she was really sweet, really nice. And um, so very often in these classes we would have someone from the spirit world who would come and and teach us some things or tell us some things or share with us some of the wisdom that you know we needed to learn uh, in order to become really good healers and this particular night we had someone come from the spirit world who was connected to this lovely lady and i can't remember her name so i'm going to say elizabeth i'm going to call her elizabeth right so she was connected, or so I thought, with Elizabeth. And um, so she was giving Elizabeth different messages. And Elizabeth was so confused, didn't know what the woman was talking about. And uh, she was told that, that in the family, there was, they used, there was a nun who had since passed. There was a nun uh, who, um, you know, she lived to be very old. Uh, she became a nun uh, against the family's wishes, on and on. This story went. And, and poor Elizabeth is looking more and more and more uh, confused by the moment until she's given a name. And the name happens to be the name of uh, her husband's aunt, who was sort of approaching her 90s at this point. So she was given this uh, really intimate <laughs> details about fam family details and um, she was so she was um, you know confused but I said to her I said I think this must be for your husband what's been told you must be for your husband not for not for you so maybe you can when you go home tell him tell him what you uh, what what you've been told tell him what you've discovered right so she said, well, my, you know, my husband is a scientist. He doesn't believe in any of this stuff. So I said, well, if he's a true scientist, then, you know, he'll be one of those people who, um, who's curious. And uh, if he's a true scientist, he'll be open-minded because that's what a true scientist is. So off she goes. And the next morning, uh, she tells her husband, whose name is Christian, she tells Christian, all about what happened and the and the message and so on and so forth and um uh, tells him that all of this information she was told that all this information could be found from his i do believe it was his great aunt so they did no more the next day which was a sunday they got in the car and went to visit great aunt whatever her name is and um 
so Christian was adamant. He said, well, he said, you know, I can understand one or two things that, that uh, were said, but he said, I can tell you, we've never had a nun in our family. There's absolutely no way that we've ever had a nun in our family because, you know, I would absolutely know about it. Well, so they went to visit great aunt and they sat and had tea. And so uh, Christian sort of very carefully says to the aunt, who even though she's in a sort of heading into a 90s, was a very sharp and, uh, you know, sort of the, you know, ev everything in place. Uh, and so uh, Christian said to her, you know, he said, um, uh, somebody mentioned to me that, um, you know, that, that it's possible that there was a nun in our family, but surely not. And she looked at him and she said, how do you know about that? And she tells him a story about, uh, and we're talking like at least uh, maybe, you know, 70, 80 years beforehand, I, one of the young women in their family, she was, uh, she, I don't think she was much more than a teenager, ran away from home and um, actually ended up and she was she was um, ostracized by her family, and she was uh, she, she was banned from the family for quite some time. But she did become, in fact, a nun, and nobody talked about her because she was the black sheep because she ran away from home. Anyway, so this great aunt tells them the entire story and also um, tells them uh, information that. Christian already knew because Elizabeth had told him what she'd been told. But it was information that he didn't know. Elizabeth didn't know. And only the great aunt knew these stories. So now Christian, being of a curious mind, um, decided, you know, maybe I, I should, maybe I should meet this woman, meaning me, right? He'd never given me much credence before. If his wife wanted to sort of get involved, that was entirely up to her. He didn't try to stop her, but he also didn't really buy into it. Of course he didn't. I mean, who would? You know, he's a scientist, you know, whatever. But now he's becoming curious. How could I possibly know these facts? How could we possibly have gotten this information that his great aunt had confirmed to him? So now normally when someone wants to come and meet with me, <coughs> excuse me, they book an appointment. But um, when Elizabeth came the following week to class, she said, you know, Christian is really intrigued, but he doesn't want to come and see you. We'd rather you came to see us. So I'm supposed to ask you if you'd like to come for tea. And I chuckled to myself. I thought, you know, OK, all right. So I said, yes, you know, I'm, I'm happy to come to tea. I had no idea what I was letting myself in for, mind you. But off I went to tea. And Christian was there and Elizabeth, they had a beautiful house. They made me very welcome. Uh, we sat and we had tea and we talked about anything and everything around, but not quite directly um, <clears throat> on the subject that I'd been invited to tea to talk about. So at some point, I feel a tap on my shoulder. No, it was not Grey Eagle, although he was there. But this was a tap on my left shoulder. And you all know that Grey Eagle always sits to my right side. So I feel a tap on my left shoulder. And I turn and I look and I see this quite a large man, uh, uh, tall, fairly heavily built, very imposing looking. And he leans and he whispers in my ear and points over to Christian. That's my grandson. So I say, OK, right. So he tells me how he passed and uh, uh, he tells me some information. And now we're all sitting around having tea. Neither of them is aware that I'm doing anything but what I am doing. And if people knew me, they'd know, they'd see it immediately. I was listening. Although I was listening to Christian and Elizabeth, I was also listening to grandfather. <clears throat> so, so I'm waiting for the moment when grandfather says something to me so I can begin what we're there for. 
even though I don't know what we're there for. Then grandfather says, you see, he's wearing my ring. And I look and on Christian's hand is a wide gold band with a, with a, some sort of a stone in, in, in it. And so uh, uh, grandfather says, go on, go on, you can, you can tell, just tell him, just tell him that you know that he's wearing my ring. So, and he chuckles to himself. So I say to Christian, so, you know, can, may, I look at, may I look at your ring? And it's completely out of the blue, out of context with anything we're talking about. And he sort of looks at me and I said, well, I, you see, I'm told that that's your grandfather's ring. And he looks at the ring and he looks at me and he, he sort of is a bit, but well, how do you, what are you talking about? How do you, how do you know that? And I said, because, and then I describe grandpa and I describe his build and how he passed and what he did for a living and all of the other wonderful information. But you see, Christian, well, he's a scientist, so he's looking at me, you know, it's all got to be proved after all. I mean, no, he's not going to take anything I say, uh, you know, uh, seriously, uh, unless I come up with the goods, whatever the goods might be. So anyway, we chat away. He said, well, I don't, I don't know how you know that that's my grandfather's ring. But he said, I suppose, well, it could be a good guess and so on anyway. So so uh, grandfather's chuckling besides, beside me and he's telling other stuff. He's giving me other information. And now Christian and Elizabeth sit, sort of sitting on the edge of their seat a little bit, uh, you know, because they, they know that what I'm saying is right. They don't know how I know it, but they know what I'm saying is right. But they just maybe, you know, maybe I've had a private detective or something. I'm, I'm assuming I'm going into scientist mode here. Is that what a scientist would think? Have I checked them out somehow? Did I know this these details beforehand? And so he's still there and he's still skeptical. He's interested. You can see he's interested, but he's still extremely skeptical until until grandfather says so he says to me and you can imagine that grandfather's thoroughly enjoying himself now can't you so grandfather says to me so now he says now tell him i know about the experiment so i'm looking to grandfather to say are you going to tell me any any more? no just tell him i know about the experiment so i say to christian you know your grandfather wants you to know that he knows about the experiment and he throws his hands up christian throws his hands up and he says i'm a scientist we're always doing experiments of one sort or another and the grandfather says oh yes but and then he begins to describe a box just a simple, looks like a simple rectangular box to me. So as grandfather's describing it to me, I'm describing it to Christian. And I describe the box. And I describe this weird sort of whatever it is, like a lift inside the box. And then I describe all of these chemicals. And now Christian is on the edge of his seat. And grandfather is not telling me the names of the chemicals, but he's telling me the color of the chemicals, because apparently it's the color of the chemicals that is how Christian will recognize them. And it's so I began begin to describe all of this. And now Christian is really on the edge of the seat. And he says he keeps saying to me, keep going, keep going, just keep going, just keep going. And so, you know, and I, I keep on going. And then grandfather says, and he just can't get it right. He's tried this way. He's tried that way. He's tried every way. He has a team of people working with him in his laboratory. They have done a trillion different equations and they simply cannot get it right. It works, but then it doesn't. Then it works a little bit, but not properly. And then it, they try something else. He says they have no clue what they need to do to perfect it. And Christian is now, his face is sort of a bit red and he's on the edge of his seat. And he says, looking at me, he says, Rosemary, he's in no doubt at all 
his grandfather is in the room with us and Christian has no doubt whatsoever now that grandfather is He's in the room, people. He's in the room. And Christian is like on the edge of his seat and he's saying, is it possible? Could he possibly? I really need to perfect the formula. And Grandpa says, oh, well, yes. I'm cutting off from the story for a minute. Do you remember, was it last week or the week before, and I told a story about how mediums are always accused of uh, giving nonsense information. Uh, you know, people always say, well, if it's true and if people can really, really talk to the dead, why don't we get fabulous information? Why can't they tell us how to change the world? Why can't they tell us this stuff? And we were talking, I was talking, I think it was last week, about what is insignificant information to one person is very significant information to another. So I want you to remember that as we continue with this story because here now are we about to listen to grandfather telling us a really significant piece of information that is actually maybe going to change the world possibly could it be that we can do this could it be that people in the spirit world know this information or know enough information that can change maybe not the entire world but thousands of people's lives is it possible that they could have that information to do that well we shall see because christian was now on the edge of his seat as i said does he can he possibly will he help me this is we've been working on this for years i know it's doable but and he goes on and on and Grandpa says, well, he says, you know, when, when it's easy, it's easy. And when it's hard, it's really, really hard. I mean, you know, I say that to people all, all the time. It's easy when it's easy. <laughs> but when it's not easy, it's really hard. So Grandpa's thoroughly enjoying himself. Christian is on the edge of his seat. His wife is sitting back. Her eyes are wide open. Her mouth, the jaw is probably down, down to, uh, to her knees. Uh, and we're all waiting. Does grandfather have the magic formula or not? Can he help Christian with his scientific project? And remember, I don't even still know what that is. I only know that it's a box with something in it that you pour liquid into that measures something. That's all I know. Because the information that the spirit world gives is, it's in this case particularly, it's not the information is not for me. The information is for Christian. Will he get the information or won't he get the information? And of course, grandfather says, okay, this is what you need to do. And he proceeds to describe the different mixture of chemicals. Now he describes them in colors more than anything else. And Christian knows what he's talking about. So it doesn't matter that I don't know, which is often the case. I don't know what people in the spirit world are talking about most of the time, but Christian knew exactly. So grandfather gives him all the information that he needs. Uh, we go on for quite a, a while more. Uh, he gives, details, measurements, all that sort of thing. Christian is furiously writing everything down. And then, you know, grandfather leaves. I'm about to leave. Christian now has his head in his hands and he's looking at me like I am, I don't know what, you know, something amazing, incredible, weirdly wonderful. Uh, but he's got his head in his hands and he says, oh, Rosemary, he said, I, I've got the biggest problem. And I said, I don't think so. You've just been given all of the stuff that you need to perfect this thing. What is it anyway? What is this box anyway? What does it do? So he begins to tell me that, uh, well, I'll tell you what it is in a minute. Let's keep going. So... Uh, so he's had his hands. I've got the biggest problem ever. I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And I said, 
I, I don't get it. You've been given the answer. You know exactly what to do. He said, yes, but I've got to go into my laboratory tomorrow and I've got all these people working for me. I've got a whole staff working for me. I can't just go in there with a piece of paper with all the equations written on it and say, this is what we've got to do. He said, they'll want to know how I've come to this conclusion. They'll want to know how I developed this idea. They'll want to know what experiments I did to come to this particular uh, scenario. What am I going to tell them? I said, well, you know what, Christian, you know what I would do if I were you? And he, he's thinking I'm going to give him, you know, the answer. And of course I do. I said, why don't you just tell them that your grandfather told you? Your grandfather gave you the information and there it is. I can't do that. I can't do that. They'll think I'm crazy. I said, okay, well, it's your choice. Well, the upshot of it all was that he did go back into his laboratory and I do not know how he told I think he might have said, I can't tell you how I've come across it, but let's figure it out. They did exactly what his grandfather told him to do, exactly, and perfected this machine that they'd been working on, which then sold all over England and then all over Europe and then all over the world. You want to know what it is, don't you? You want to know what it is. So here is the thing. Women suffer with um, with uh, bone uh, uh, loss of uh, whatever that is in the bones, calcium in the bones. And um, years ago, you know, there was no way to tell whether you were a woman who was who was suffering with this, uh, or whether you. There's a name that you call it. I forget. I forget what it's called. Osteoporosis. Osteoporosis. There we go. So there's, there was no way to know if you were a candidate for osteoporosis and we know that osteoporosis is really it's severe it's a it's a very severe condition and um so for years and years and years people all over the world scientists all over the world were trying to perfect a way to measure bone density to see if a woman was susceptible or not because if they could find that a woman was susceptible well then they could do something about it and couldn't necessarily cure the osteo osteoporosis but prevent it for a long time and, and prevent it from becoming really really serious so, so we're talking about something that is it it's literally a, a matter of life and death for many many women all over the world which is why this little machine sold all over the world and um so this machine that Christian perfected uh, is um, measures of bone density. Now, that was years ago. They may have something that's even better now, quicker now, who knows? But this was the first machine of its kind. Christian became a, a very famous, very eminent scientist. He was all, already eminent. He was already very well known in his field, but he became like the superhero of, uh, of whatever he did. He traveled all over the world. He was invited all over the world. This machine was in, uh, the, eventually kept, went into every single hospital, uh, certainly in the Western world and probably in, in um, uh, you know, other countries also. Um, all because grandfather, how could that be? How, how could it be? Oh yeah, he, yeah, he knew the formula. Now, when I was writing my first book, I called all of the people I wanted to tell stories about and I called Christian. By this time, I think Christian was very, very vocal, uh, but to totally unembarrassed now about saying, well, my grandfather told me and people thought either they didn't believe him or they thought he was a bit, a little bit crazy, but that's all right because he's now an eminent scientist and uh, aren't eminent scientists supposed to be the mad scientists a little bit anyway? So, so I called him and I said, can I... You know, can I write your story? He said, you can write my story and you can use my name. Wow. Big difference from, oh, I don't know about this. And maybe, you you know, this mind reading or I don't know how you come about this stuff to 
My name is Christian Langton. Tell anybody and everybody you like. This is what happened. Okay. Now you think that's the end of the story, don't you? You think I'm now going to say the end, but not quite. Not quite. Because Christian and his wife were very, very keen uh, horse riders. They'd, they'd actually just started to learn when I first met them. And um, then uh, as Christian got into the horse world and as he got more and more into the horse world, he realized that not only do women have osteoporosis, but it's something that many horses suffer from also. So he called me and he said, Rosemary, he said, uh, I'm, um, you know, I'm thinking of developing this thing for horses. What do you think? He said, or rather, what does grandpa think? Do you think you could help me with this? And I laughed and I said, oh, Christian, your grandfather is right there for you and with you anytime and will help you with anything. And uh, yes, so Christian did uh, develop a machine that now that can test um, osteoporosis or bone loss uh, in in horses as well as uh, as well as people. So you see the the moral of this story is that although people say that mediums are people in the spirit world they don't tell us anything worth knowing it's just little insignificant bits that are only important to the family uh, that i thought i would give you that example having given you the example last week of the small details are significant to the people who were given them to this detail revolutionized uh the medical profession and the way that the medical profession uh, looked upon and treated osteoporosis, which um, I think is an amazing, amazing thing. So I'm going to say thank you, Grandpa Langton, wherever you may be, for helping your grandson to develop this extraordinary, extraordinary machine. The end. Did you like that story? Excellent. <laughs> Mary Lou sitting here smiling away. Uh, Chris, did you like that story? I, <clears throat> I love that story. <laughs> and uh, the people in the chat room are expressing similar comments. I am was saying that's an amazing story. Karen says that's so cool. And others are starting to type in. It really, it really is because uh, as we, you know, as we, uh, you know, thought about it last week, we talked about what is in, insignificant to most people is significant, a significant detail to the person that the detail has been given to. But this is uh, not only not in, an insignificant detail, it's a very significant detail, but didn't only benefit Christian and his wife, didn't only benefit, you know, the English population, it benefited people and hospitals and doctors all over the world. Uh, which, you know, that's, that's, uh, and, and so many people don't, they don't talk about how, uh, when, when people like myself talk to those in the spirit world, we really can affect, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, the, a lot of this information that we get is not insignificant. A lot of the information that we get can be really, really significant. If only, if only people would understand and take us more seriously, you know that we have details that literally as in as is shown in the last story literally can change the world even if only in some small way it changes our world and makes a huge difference right chris questions comments all of that stuff let's go well rhonda says i was amazed when i read this story and now hearing it again <laughs> on story time Yes, you'll find that story, and it has more detail than I've been able to tell you. Uh, in the, you know, in the, in the in the book, you know, I'm I'm just telling the the, the glossary of the story, but it gives you it does give you more detail. But you'll find that story in the Eagle and the Rose, and it's fitting that I should tell a story from the Eagle and the Rose because we are in our twenty first year of publication of the Eagle and the Rose. It was our twenty fifth, twenty first. Oh God. 21st anniversary, was it 20th or 21st? 21st anniversary in May that the Eagle and the Rose was 
first published and that was traveled all over the world and um, it's also uh, it's been buried with many people i think it's the one book more than any other that i've ever written that is placed in the coffin when people bury their loved ones it's put in the coffin with them uh, because so many people find that book uh, really and truly so inspirational as as do i chris Maria says, I grew up in a loveless family, so hearing this story makes my heart so happy. Oh, good, good. Well, um, look, uh, you know, it, it makes me sad when I hear people say that they grew up in a loveless family. You know, you all know that I did the same thing. But isn't it wonderful that we are able to learn um, how important love is because i think when we don't get it when we don't receive it you know uh our those people in our family they teach us they can really teach us if we allow it they can teach us how not to be and so i made absolute certain i mean it was one of those things that as i was carrying my daughter it was one of those things i thought about over and over and over again i was not going to bring my child up in the way that I was brought up. I was going to bring my child up in a in a family of love and warmth and caring and understanding and listening and all of those things that I never had as a child. And my darling, obviously you never had as a child, but isn't it wonderful that we have the opportunity uh, through learning what it feels like not to be loved, that we must show our love. Chris. Okay, Maria's on and she's translating from Italian to English in the chat room. Okay. So she's asking um, or commenting, I wish to know about my mother, Albina, who is no longer here. Um, well, I'm going to suggest then uh, we have a, a webinar next Saturday. Uh, we will be spending three hours giving messages to people in the webinar uh if you don't know how to get to the webinar if you don't know how to book a ticket go to my website rosemaryaltea.com and you'll see there you'll be able to find tickets or you can email chris k-r-i-s and say to chris how do i get into the webinar uh we always we only do small groups so that you know small groups means that more people have a chance to receive a message but Gradle and I will be sitting here next Saturday morning there'll be no story time next week we'll be sitting here hopefully inundated with your loved ones in the spirit world those who want to give messages those who want to to join in with us and I'll be giving lots and lots of different messages three hours worth of messages uh next Saturday so please join us then and, and again, I'll say either go to the website and find out how you can book a ticket or um, email Chris. Chris. All right. So Miriam's on from Germany. Hi, Miriam. She has a question. Yes. Last night she saw the movie Apocalypto. Oh, yeah. That had Mel Gibson and was wondering if you got to know any rituals or wisdom from Grey Eagle and his native people. Yes, I did actually. Uh, th thank you for asking that. Um, you know, the, the Native Americans uh, believe in, uh, you know, honoring uh, Mother Earth. They, they uh, believe in honoring the, the four corners of the, of the Earth. They believe in cleansing. Um, my friend Jeff, who I don't know if he's on this morning, but my friend Jeff uh, has has a place in uh, in Maine, and he has regular he he does sweat lodges. He has his own sweat lodge, and he invites people to go into the sweat lodge. Uh, um, there are lots of rituals. There are lots of special ways that the Native Americans uh, believed. Um, they use sage for cleaning uh giving you know cleaning the energy clearing the energy um but everything really is is it's something that comes from the mind it's our mind power our mind energy that we use so, and often the rituals that we perform or that other people perform uh those rituals are, then it's, it's 
it's not the actual ritual itself it's the ritual reminds you of how you need to think how you need to be the type of energy that you're needing to create and going through the ritual going through the motions going through the steps in other words of the ritual is what creates the energy it's what creates the type of energy uh, and that type of god force that we're always looking for to use in in our in our daily lives so gray eagle has taught me uh, many of those things and um, and again i'll say to you you know rituals are the ritual is not it the, let me do it another way the magic is not in the ritual the magic is in the fact that the ritual reminds us of the steps we take to create the energy that we need to to uh, that that we need to use um, in the eagle and the rose there is a, an amazing true story i think it's in the eagle and the rose pretty sure about my trip to egypt and uh, my uh, my ride down the river nile on a falucca which is a little boat with a single sail and uh, <laughs> you need to you've got to read that story talking of rituals and talking of ways to create energy and how to create energy and what that energy can do uh, that's a great story for you to for, for you to read and i can't remember the name of the story but anyway it's in the eagle and the rose and it's my my tale of egypt staying in the old palace of the old king farouk so because there's a there's a new palace which is a very modern building uh and then there's the old palace and you can they actually have it as a hotel and you can actually go there and that and it's sits right on the river nile and it overlooks the valley of the kings and the valley of the queens and that's if you're going to egypt that's the place to stay chris carmen is asking um well first she says this story is amazing and then rosemary do you and gray eagle have a message for me i'm having health issues with my nerves and muscles is there any advice um well certainly Chris, I know you're, if you, we'll take your name and we'll put you on our healing list and we'll send you healing uh, every day. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, I think, I'm also going to, to suggest you, but we, I wish we had more time, but we don't. But in the short time that we have, I'm going to suggest that you, you find a, a way to meditate. Now we have uh, four meditation uh cds that i created with gray eagle and it's my little voice on those cds that you'll hear and uh, you can buy these cds through itunes you can buy them through um well go to our website you'll find out how to get them through the website but i think you need to to sort of do something like that uh on a regular not just daily but at least twice daily basis to to help you because i think you know uh, our state of mind uh, affects our body tremendously and then what we're suffering with our with physically affects our mind even more so so that's the first thing i would suggest that you do chris mark says dearest rosemary this is simply just another prime example of the ability you have to change the hearts and minds of unbelievers you see for those who believe no explanation is necessary for those who don't believe no explanation is possible until they <laughs> receive the blessing of your presence and the loved one reaching out to them. Well, Mark, I, I love you for saying that. And thank you very much for saying that, but it really doesn't have much to do with me. I, I do try to explain to people, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking to the spirit world and they're often, they often, often, you know, they, they have an agenda. They know exactly what they want to say to us. They know exactly what we need to hear from them. It's not always what we want to hear, but it's always what we need to hear. And um, and often with the back and forth that goes along and I, re and I relay what I'm hearing to my, let's say to my clients or to, to, or to my audience, wherever it happens that I am, you, you know, it's very hard because I seem to be the, the, the all knowing, the all seeing, you know, I, see, I seem to know exactly what I'm doing, what I'm talking about. Here is the truth. I know nothing. I just repeat. I'm sort of like the go-between. It goes into my ears and out of my mouth. And it's not, although I'm a very curious person, 
and I do want to understand and I often after the consultation or after the giving the message I'll often say to the person I'm giving the message to so okay as I did with Christian Langton okay yeah what what, what was that all about then because I, I want to know but as we're talking about stuff and the grandfather's relaying to his grandson or the mother's relaying to a daughter or, or the son is relaying to his parents whatever the information is that's coming I don't actually know what they don't understand it I don't get it I have no clue what it is that they're saying so so um, you know so I'm not the all-knowing and all-seeing I just seem like it I'm just grateful that those in the spirit world are able to um, to to do it and to use me and I'm grateful that they use me I've got visitors coming in the house. Okay. You have about four minutes left, Rosemary. Okay. So do we have any more questions or comments very quickly? Yes. Bonnie says that was absolutely delightful. Love you, Rosemary, and your books that I have read. Love best wishes and blessings from Stevenston, British Columbia, Canada. All right. The Eagle in the Rose was so fascinating and such a blessing to me. What a world of wonder. Oh, thank you. Wow. <laughs> what fabulous comments thank you so very much we appreciate it anything else chris helen says after reading just a few of your books i am in awe no one would ever guess all the trials and tribulations you've been through and how strong you must be well you know it's all the trials and the tribulations that make us <laughs> you know that make us who we are isn't it uh and uh, as i said earlier you know we learn if we're really, really lucky, we learn how not to be through those people who treat us badly. So, you know. All right. Well, there's a no story time next week because we're doing our uh, webinar. And if you want to join in, please go to the website, rosemaryoutair.com or email Chris, K-R-I-S at rosemaryoutair.com. In the meantime, thank you all of you for joining me. I do love having you all coming. We love your comments. We love your questions. I'd like to say thank you to Chris very much so, uh, who um, who's organizing, well, everything, actually. I don't know what to do without her. And last but not least, I'd like to say thank you to Gregor, who, as always, is standing here, smiling away, hand on my shoulder. Uh, we wish you, all of you, um, a very blessed uh, rest of the day and a very blessed rest of the weekend everybody bye bye